Good afternoon. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, we'll wait one or two more minutes just to make sure uh, we let everybody get in. I know uh, we've adjusted our, our, our time, so uh, people may just still be trickling in. So I'll give it one or two more minutes and, and we'll get going uh, for our first HIPAM uh, meeting of the 2021 year. All right, we'll get going. And if more, we have more friends and uh, who join us, then then definitely uh, excited to have them. So uh, once again, happy new year, everybody. Um, I think everybody here has uh, seen our updated webinar format, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Starting with our neighbors uh, across the Pacific, Japan, um, they are still going through uh, a surge, especially in Tokyo, the, the mayor is considering, um, if not already executed, uh, a more stringent stay at home type of policy. Uh, one of the considerations was closing restaurants down um, at 8, um, uh, 8 p.m. because from their information, a lot of the, the cases within Tokyo City was driven by uh, by restaurants and, and that, that type of activity. So uh, concerning, um, especially the, the, the big thing, big event for them is the Olympics later on this year. So um, that's what we're going to continue to watch. And, and thanks RP, that is the uh, COVID19japan.com. That is where we're pulling uh, this particular data from. So thanks for that. Uh, going to the national overview, you know, it was looking hopeful um, where, where we were trending down uh, at the end of December or middle of December, but once again, back on an upward tick as a nation overall. Unfortunately, uh, you know, no, we, we could have expected this in terms of a holiday increase, you know, from, from the, uh, the travel authorities. I think over a million traveled from January 1st through for the next, you know, through January 4th and 5th. So travel volume was, was higher than what was hoped. And that's probably going to feel more spread. And Marguerite's going to speak more about uh, the UK strain um, that, that we haven't seen a lot yet, but we're seeing more of and will eventually probably become the prevalent strain um, for, for our country. Uh, state level overview. Arizona, California, uh, we, we go through, for those, anybody who's new, we, we go through um, you know, the, the major states where we see a lot of traffic between uh, Hawaii and the states. So Arizona uh, still trending up um, in cases and, and, and their hospitalizations have increased as so as their ICU, uh, ICU utilization. California, if you're seeing any, any news, uh, is also dealing with, the same, with similar issues in terms of case, uh, cases rising. Uh, ICU capacity being reached uh, and hospitalization capacity being reached, all while uh, COVID vaccination efforts are trying to move forward. Nevada uh, was trending down for a good part of uh, the end of 2020, uh, but uh, seeing an uptick, slight downtick, but once again, uh, understanding that there's a lot going on, uh, CONUS side and, and travel is a lot easier uh, by car, um, so, so we'll, we'll wait and see. Texas also trending back up again, uh, though we thought we're seeing a downward trend. So, um, you know, still, still keeping an eye out on all of these, all of these major states. Moving on to our Hawaii overview, 
Maui uh, clusters have, have driven the cases up in terms of cases per 100,000. Uh, statewide, we're, we're about 10 and, and, and county of Honolulu mirroring pretty much the state trends. Uh, percent positivity, uh, as a state, we're about three, a little over 3%. Uh, Honolulu County, 4.5% uh, as of today. Uh, and, and if you go to wanawahu.org, uh, they have now started to differentiate be, uh, the, the seven day average as well as the percent positivity based on inclusion of the uh, prison clusters and not. So uh, I, forgive me, I, I believe when I checked this morning, it was 103 for the seven day case average, including prison clusters and a percent positivity of 4.5%. Uh, and then that drops to 4.2%, excluding the prison clusters. Um, so not, not a drastic drop in the percent positivity, but the, the case, the seven day case average did drop from 103 to about 84 give or take. So um, we'll have that slide moving forward because now it's a little harder to track. But once again, Oahu uh, uh, at that 4.5% and then uh, understanding that uh, we do go back to tier one if we need the 5% percent positivity and the uh, triple digit seven day case average. Uh, a new slide that we've added uh, and thanks to the great work for all of our partners, uh, DOH, um, all of our community partners, uh, the, the Hawaii Air National Guard, the Hawaii National Guard for, and all the rest of our partners for, for getting this vaccine effort uh, up and running. It, it, there's a lot of hurdles logistically and, and education wise, um, but we're, and, and I'm so happy to see the data um, being shared with the community in terms of progress that we can see. So as of uh, the last update, uh, a little over 25, close to 25,500 uh, have been administered, and, and I believe that the second round, uh, second round doses have started to uh, go out this week um, at the hospitals, um, to the best of my knowledge. So once again, it's great that we can start to track this um, as we move over time. Testing turnaround time. Uh, still staying re uh, re really good in terms of our ability to get test results within a 24 hour period. Um, understanding that if we do send it away, it's, it's for, it's not the state labs, um, it's for our contracted partners out, but still doing a really good job in terms of that. Moving forward to our forecasting overview, let me see if Levi's on, uh, doesn't appear that he's on, so I will brief this uh, for him. He's uh, quarantining in Utah, so he's, the time difference is, uh, is four hours for him. But you, you can see that our, our pessimistic is trending up in terms of our cases. Our, our, our expected uh, is, is still relatively flat uh, right now. It, it's hard to tell, even with an increase in the past few days, uh, where we're still trying to get more clarity in terms of how many of the cases the past few days are, are due to uh, existing clusters, if those clusters have been contained, or these are new clusters, or how many of these cases are due to community transmission due to Christmas, understanding that we'll still probably see uh, some sort of case increase, hopefully not, but uh, ex preparing for some sort of case count due to the uh, New Year celebrations. So that's why we have uh, a relatively wide dispersion um, for our cases, hospitalizations, uh, still a pretty narrow bandwidth, um, understanding that there's a lag. So even though we're currently projecting a pretty flat uh, case uh, projection, um, our hospitalizations um, are, are lagging, and then also our ICUs, fatalities. Uh, thankfully, we've, we've seen that pretty flat and constant of the past month or so, um, and hopefully that will continue. And then once again, this is the same data just presented in, 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 a, in a numerical format uh, for everybody to, to see so we can kind of get a more granular perspective. Um, Steve, uh, live website through 1220 shows much sharper rise in ICU and hospitalization. So uh, I will, Steve, let, let me check uh, the live website versus what uh, we put up. And, and if there's, uh, Something that something that we need to deconflict that then we'll make sure that's reflected on the live website. So so thanks for that. Um, with that, if there's any other questions, please uh, feel free to ask them in the uh, Q and A section. Uh, we have a great presentation by uh, 
Dr. Butler, um, but I, there, there are, as always, so many uh, highlights, it, it's impossible to keep track of, but some major ones that, that I wanted to bring to the attention of, of the group here, and please feel free to disseminate the information. We make all of our, um, uh, all of our links and all of our presentations viewable and shareable on, on our website, uh, VO Community Workgroup on our uh, upper right hand tab. Can we add the vaccine distro to Heimer? Yes, we can. If I'm understanding the, that question, RP, um, the vaccine distribution data from Haima to, to the slide deck, if you could clarify a little more, that, that'd be great. Um, and then for sure, we'll, we'll address that as, as to the best of our ability. Uh, but we, there are some, uh, the major uh, science highlights uh, that, that I want to bring to the attention of the group. Um, first one, CDC released yesterday uh, allergic reaction uh, data to the to the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, and then we we got uh, peer reviewed results published by the New England Journal uh, that verified uh, efficacy data for both the Pfizer and Moderna clinical trials, and then uh, a statement. There's been a, a lot of good discussion um, within HIPAM and, and a lot also nationally and internationally in terms of uh, whether or not to increase the intervals or the duration between vaccine doses and the FDA put out a statement. Um, and, and I'll speak to that a little more um, when we get to that slide. So uh, just major summaries, the link you can find on the slide prior. Uh, so of the 1.8, almost 1.9 million doses that were given between 14 and 23 December, uh, 21 cases of anaphylaxis were, were detected um, which comes out to about 11.1 .1 cases per, per million doses. 71% um, of those 21 cases occurred within 15 minutes of vaccination. And 80% of those 21 cases had documented history of allergy. So once again, nothing that we weren't expecting. Um, and we have very clear guidelines in terms of the clinical side to, to have everybody wait 15 minutes after, uh, post vaccination to, to, to ensure that we do catch those who uh, uh, who, who might experience anaphylaxis. Uh, for all types of total adverse events, 0.2% um, of, uh, of all those who got vaccinated uh, reported some sort of adverse uh, events. Once again, understanding that there may be under or over reporting, um, but that's still a, a, a really low number that we need to continue to push out uh, to, to educate uh, folks who, who may be on the fence for vaccinations in terms of hesitancy uh, with regards to side effects. Though it is worth noting for comparison rate of anaphylaxis for flu vaccine is about 1.3 cases per million. But once again, it's still uh, a, a very safe vaccine in terms of anaphylaxis. Uh, moving on to the second highlight. So, uh, you know, we read at your leisure. There's just a lot of data, but the, the takeaways is that uh, the, the data, uh, the, the, journal, the articles from New England Journal confirm the 94% efficacy and the 95% efficacy of both the Moderna and Pfizer uh, vaccines from the clinical trials respectively. Uh, still left to confirm, but I, I do believe that they, are, they have started the trials. Uh, look at the safety and efficacy in our uh, higher risk populations, our children and our pregnant, uh, pregnant mothers. And then what's still left to confirm Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, so when we upload uh, the the slide deck, uh, you'll be able to to access the links when 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 you when you uh, view uh, when you download that. Uh, but what's still left to also confirm, and this is going to be huge uh, information for for everybody, especially uh, epidemiologists and, and people in the modeling space, is whether or not and if they do, to what extent vaccines can decrease uh, future transmission. So. Uh, once again, there's still a lot of unknowns, but the good thing is that they are, those questions are being studied. It's just like any good, good, good research project and uh, data, data, data trial, it takes time. And, and I know these questions uh, are important and we want to be able to answer them. But right now, unfortunately, we don't have uh, answers. Though I'll, I believe uh, I, I saw today that uh, Imperial College London just released a preprint of uh, the the new strain in terms of the 50% uh, increased um, 
transmissibility, and, and I'm sure uh, Marguerite will speak more to that. Finally, the last one, and, and then I'll, I'll give up the rest of my time, is the uh, FDA put out a statement two days ago saying that uh, clinicians and everybody who's participating in this vaccine effort should stick to uh, the 21 day interval between the first and the second shot for the Pfizer vaccine and the 28 days for, for the Moderna. Um, so for the United States currently sticking to that. Um, in terms of other countries, uh, England and Denmark have approved a delayed second shot COVID vaccine uh, up to I believe six or seven weeks um, just because you know we have different hypotheses in terms of just getting everybody vaccinated with that first shot and then we'll deal with a second shot. FDA is still sticking with uh, this regimen so we'll see and I know from modeling perspective there's really interesting hypotheses and scenarios that might play out so that's why I thought that this was worth mentioning um, in terms of what the FDA put out versus what other countries are putting out. Um, thanks for, for, for clarifying that the vaccine data on the live Haima dashboard. We'll, we'll make sure to incorporate that uh, moving forward. Rukia, if you can make a note of that and, and we'll, we'll, we'll add that to uh, next week's um, slide. And, and with that, let me just make sure. Uh, Marguerite, you're going to share your slides, right? Okay, so um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to stop screen sharing. Thank you for uh, for your time and hand it over to my dear colleague, Marguerite. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let me just switch over. All right. Can everybody see that? I hope. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to, my best to update you on the, um, the, the new strains um, of SARS-CoV-2 from the UK and South Africa. And um, there are a lot of concerns about vaccine efficacy. So I'll try my best to explain um, why the experts pretty much aren't, don't think that this is an immediate um, issue. Uh, I'm not a virologist, but I did consult with my colleague uh, Howard Shen, who is a virologist, and so uh, hopefully he'll join later today. He's busy. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist and physiologist. Anyway, okay, so um, yeah, this was announced on the 20th, the rapid increase of the variant from the UK, and um, the, sorry, this is a little recap for some of you who saw it the last time, but um, the signal was basically that the cases of COVID are rising rapidly, and that was really the signal that led off the UK people as well as the South Africans to tip them off to the existence of the new strain. Um, so when they saw the cases rising, they started sequencing and identified that most of those belong to the new variant. So keep in mind that it was detected because they have their massive genomic surveillance efforts. And what was kind of sh quite shocking was that the new variant has 17 mutations and that they appeared to arise all at the same time with nine in the spike region. So I don't know if there's more up-to-date data, but at the time the estimated transmission increase was 70%, which would, could lead to a viral reproductive number increase of 0.4. Um, again, no indication of increased virulence or mortality, um, but just increased transmission. And these are the nine spike mutations. So these are the curves of increased case incidents. It rose really sharply, like surprisingly sharply, and also most significantly in the younger cohorts as opposed to the older cohorts. And again, uh, like the 614G strain, um, this strain is rapidly increasing and projected to replace the other strains. So there, this led to a lot of questions. Um, is there going to be wider spread or greater diverse disease severity? Will the vaccine still work on these new variants? Um, that was a huge concern. And then the other issues potentially are that because the sequence has changed, will it then be um, thwart detection by PCR? Uh, and then is there an increased potential for reinfection of, of individuals if it's mutated enough? Okay, so, so 
I try to cover this in some, some little bit of background. <laughs> okay, so first of all, is the UK strain the same as the South African strain, uh, B117 versus B1351? And um, from phylogenetic analysis, we see clearly, no, here's the UK strain and here's the South African strain. They're both, they're independently derived. They evolved separately and then have proliferated. You can see how much it's proliferated. They do share the um, five, they do share, okay, I'll, I'll get to that later. Importantly, um, so it's, it's useful to think too about the sequencing bias. So in Europe, th this is Emma Hogcroft, and she's a very prominent um, phylogeneticist a virologist and phylogeneticist, and she's one of the co-developers of the Next Strain platform you may be familiar with. Anyway, um, she points out that in Europe, the UK and Denmark are the, are the most prolific sequencers. Um, so it could be elsewhere and just not detected yet. And in Africa, the same is true for South Africa. So this was a call for more coordinated sequencing efforts. And she's got this really cool update that you might want to check out um, on Twitter. Uh, a lot of the latest developments are, are on Twitter. Okay, so it's been characterized molecularly, right? Um, these are the mutants, the spike mutations on the UK strain and the spike mutations on the South African strain. And you can see that they both share this N501Y mutation. And so, um, but they, and they share this D614G mutation. Both of these are associated with higher transmissibility. So, but they also have a number of distinct mutations, as you can see. And the ones that had people really concerned were the ones on the receptor binding domain. And because the South African strain has three on the receptor binding domain, whereas the UK strain had one, I think, as far as I can tell, led to the speculation by some people that this, this strain was worse potentially than this one. But I wanna really caution that that's very speculative. Um, it's only verifiable through experimental evidence. And um, I'll, I'll explain to you why. Okay, so <laughs> um, don't freak out by this picture, but just to, to share with you that viruses mutate frequently. That's what they do. They just, they evolve, they mutate. So the more that we transmit this virus around the world, the more opportunities it has to mutate. But um, the good news is that all these mutations are intensively studied. They're tracked like by scientists all around the world. Uh, this is a paper that actually cataloged all of the spike mutations that their particular interest was human to human versus human to animal transmission. So they were looking at mutations that gave rise to interspecific transmission capabilities. But they also highlighted um, these red were the UK mutations sites, the blue are the South African, and then the yellow were the human to animal sites. So this is the receptor binding domain where it actually um, sticks to the ACE2 receptor. And then this, this is the amino terminal domain, another domain that's also linked to changes that increase uh, transmissibility. And then this is a furin cleavage site, which also is a, an area of, of interest. But you can see that there's mutations that occur all the time. And um, this is a large protein, like there's 1500, over 1200 amino acids. Um, and so there are like many, many potential epitopes for antibodies to target and um, become specially calibrated for. So most of these mutations have no functional effect whatsoever. They just keep changing. Um, but sometimes they do. And when they actually increase transmissibility, that's when they start to get selected and then start to replace other strains um, that don't transmit as well. Okay, so that's the real concern is sort of well, reducing case count. Um, so it is possible that eventually the, uh, some virus could mutate enough that it would escape vaccine or other sorts of immune surveillance, but it would take a lot of mutations before that would happen. 
And that's kind of the basis for why people think. But I'll, I'll uh, help you review a little bit of immunology to better understand all of the defenses. Okay, so I just want to make that point that predicting vaccine escape from only the sequence information is, is quite speculative. And um, any conclusions about this really have to be verified through experimental methods. Okay, so as I said, um, SARS-CoV-2 is a big virus, viral genome, relatively speaking, and the mutations occur all the time. Here's the spike mutation. And literally thousands of mutations have been documented for SARS-CoV-2, thousands. But when we see a mutation that is very, very frequent, that's a signal that there's some selection going on there. And that's where people really start to follow those. And this is the D614G mutation. Okay, so the big questions. Will the vaccine remain effective against new variants? So just to give you a little bit of background, um, I had to review this myself. <laughs> so um, immune responses to viral infection. So you have the virus being taken up and infecting cells. That's day one, okay? And then those viruses get either replicated or, or processed and then so you start to develop an immune response. So in, in part, this is the nonspecific immune response, uh, the innate response. And basically that it's like inflammatory type responses. It's not yet tuned to any particular virus. It's just looking for invaders. And um, I guess one thing that people sort of speculate is that uh, children tend to have a stronger innate immune response than adults. And that might be why maybe um, that they're a little more resistant to SARS-CoV-2, maybe, but nobody really knows. Um, yeah, so we start to start off with this inflammatory response, developing cytokines and natural killer cells to try to kill the infected cells to prevent proliferation. And then um, this inflammatory response recruits macrophage, it activates them and alerts them. They come and they gobble up these things and they present antigen to B cells and T cells, the humoral and the cellular immune responses. Eventually you start to make antibodies and this is the neutralizing antibody response that everyone's talking about. Um, and then if you get challenged with it again, you'll develop a stronger antibody response. So part of the reason, as I said, people are very worried that if you have mutations in the receptor binding domain, that game over, we're gonna be dead, <laughs> okay? But um, I wanna tell you that antibodies stick all over these proteins. Okay? So the antibody is a large protein. It's these red knobs here. It's really quite large. And antibodies can stick all over this thing. So they stick to spike, and there's multiple ways that they can block coronavirus. So yes, they can block the receptor binding site, so then SARS can't attach to the receptor and it can't enter our cells. But antibodies also cause agglutination. They, they have this Y shape, and so they can like stick them together, and then they can clump up all the viruses, and then that also inactivates them, so viruses can't enter. They also, through that inflammatory response, signal macrophage, which come in phagocytos, they basically eat the virus and they neutralize them that way. But then they also present the parts on their surfaces, which then um, recruits other aspects of the immune system. They also attract complement proteins, which come and stick to them and help kill them. And then they also coat the virus, making them really sticky and so helping them. So it's a really multifactorial antibody response. Um, and like, it's not just the receptor binding domain, it's like anywhere on the surface of the virus. So the ingenious thing about the mRNA vaccines is that they contain information for spike, and it's only spike, and they're able to elicit an immune response based on that. And then it, the, they, each person generates lots and lots of antibodies toward spike, like all over the spike protein, it's not just one type. Okay, so you might have heard the word monoclonal antibody, that's one clone. 
but um, we have like a multitude of clones of antibodies that we will, each person will generate when challenged by the antigen. Okay, so, but there's more, <laughs> okay? So um, it's not just antibodies, mRNA vaccines are really amazing. Um, so, so to back up, vaccines that elicit, like mimic infection are much more effective because they, they, tar they, they rise up many parts of the immune system. Okay, and so the, the brilliance is that the mRNAs actually elicit multiple immune responses. So you, you put the mRNA in there, it starts to make proteins, the spike protein, it will generate a cytokine response. So this, these will like cause inflammation and alert the immune system that there's something going on here. It will activate the B cells. Okay, so that will elicit the humoral antibody response and the T cells, which are the killer cells. Okay, and so this is the cellular response. There's multiple arms of the immune response. And these two lineages will also create memory cells so that when you're challenged again, you'll, you'll have a much stronger, more long lasting immune response and be able to neutralize anything really quickly. And that's the basis of the two dose vaccine regime. Um, okay, so this is just a slide from Moderna. So they inject you in your muscle with mRNA encased within a liposome, like a lipid envelope. And it's just for the spike, right? So it doesn't, you can't get the virus from this. It's not possible because you, you don't have enough information to, to replicate the virus. It just makes a spike. So spikes can be presented on the cell surface. They can also be presented through major histocompatibility molecules which then interface with the T cells and B cells that trigger the other parts of the immune system. Um, and anyway, this is a lot of detail, but muscle cells and then special antigen pre presenting cells. So it really gets your immune system in business, okay? Um, and then the beauty of it is that mRNA is not very um, long lasting, so it will, fairly quickly become degraded. It's not going to get incorporated into your genome or anything like that. It will get degraded. So it'll trigger this immune response and then it will just go away. Okay, so this slide I'm just, <laughs> I, um, I wanted to just also bring up this point about the immune response. So people are worried that as the virus mutates, we'll lose our immunity. Okay, but um, there's this process after the initial uh, B cell matching, there's an affinity maturation of these B cells. And so what happens is the, you find a match, but then those uh, B cells start to go undergo somatic mutation. And then they will, it'll make, your body will make a lot of mutants that will then find an even better match. And so every time you get re-challenged with this antigen on the second dose or another exposure or another exposure, your body goes through another process of affinity maturation of B cells. So your body will continue to adapt and fine tune to the antigens that it's challenged with. Okay, so with this repeated exposure, the somatic mutations improve the fit to spike. So it doesn't have to match perfectly, to elicit the response. And then once it does, it will fine tune it to match much better. Um, okay, so just to summarize, sorry, I know it's a lot of information. Adults produce naive B cells. So this is what happens normally, okay? You just naturally produce naive B cells in random combinations. It's purely just physical, like does it fit? Does it match the antigen? But there's like hundreds of millions of variations that you produce each day. So um, it's pretty amazing, actually. <laughs> any, you know, any handful of them will match some particular antigen. When that happens, the B cells will undergo affinity maturation. The somatic mutations will improve the fit to the antigen, in this case, spike. They become B memory cells stored away for later in case you get exposed again. 
And then the adaptive memory is not set in stone. Okay, so it's not like that's it, you're done. No, the maturation, this part will happen every time you're exposed. So our immune system will keep evolving for better fit. And then the mRNA vaccine also recruits other components of the immune response, not just the antibody response, but cytokine and some inflammatory response and the T cell response. And it'll alert macrophage and other players, um, other parts of your nonspecific immune responses. Okay, um, so here's some good news. <laughs> so people did a study where um, they, so there was a concern about how long lasting the antibody response was. Um, and so it, this study was different because they actually looked at cases with mild to moderate symptoms, not severe symptoms, okay, just mild to moderate. So they followed 30,000 infected individuals and they found that the vast majority of people showed a really strong neutralizing antibody titer and it lasted for at least five months, which was really great news. Oh, and I just I should also say that um, as they're doing the clinical trials for those vaccines, they're really excited to see all the different aspects of the immune response coming from the, um, the challenge with the vaccine. And so that, that's why people feel really good about this robust immune response. Okay, here's the scary part. <laughs> so how did the UK strain arise with 17 mutations at once? Um, so normally viruses mutate, you know, it's like one mutation at a time. Um, you know, it's kind of a step-by-step -step kind of thing. But this one arose with 17 mutations. And so this was a really interesting study that you could check out. Um, and it's highly transmissible. So of course, this is the concern. Vaccines and therapeutics are designed around the spike. It raises the theoretical possibility of viral escape. And so this preprint uh, went into how did this new variant arise. And it was a really a kind of an unusual situation because they discovered it in the UK in a patient. Um, so they actually could track it through time. Okay, so um, this cancer, it was a cancer patient and this person in total was infected for 101 days. Um, and over this course of time was sampled and sequenced 23 times. So there was no change over 65 days and it had two doses of remdesivir, or the person had two doses of remdesivir. Um, he, had, he or she had convalescent plasma treatment. And at that point, the variant strain emerged with several mutations. It sort of rose and fell. And then a final unsuccessful dose of convalescent plasma was given, followed by a rise of this variant strain. Okay, so um, this was an immunocompromised patient. And so this immune system wasn't there and it basically allowed this mutant to, to evolve because it went through so many cycles of viral replication. Okay, so in vitro, this escape variant um, has decreased sensitivity to plasma um, and was highly, it was highly ineffective. So it suggested that the convalescent plasma treatment on this immunocompromised individual created positive selection on um, the SARS-CoV-2. So yeah, so that's a danger of, um, well, for an immunocompromised person to use a monoclonal antibody. And so you definitely want to have def um, polyclonal antibodies in order to make sure that you are not just selecting for a stronger strain, but actually killing it. Um, that was one of the um, recommendations that came out of it. So this was for the UK strain. Um, there's nine mutations on spike. Um, so one concern is that the deletions or mutations will interfere with PCR or other diagnostics because it relies on the match to the sequence for the amplification to happen for PCR. So labs should, now that we know that there's these things going on, that labs should remain vigilant. And they are actually using the S gene dropout. So, so this variant, B117, in a PCR test, you have a, um, an assay for the spike S gene and the N, the nucleocapsid gene. And um, if you get a positive N and a, a no spike because of this mutation, uh, that's kind of a signal for the new strain. 
And so they actually, we, all these health departments are using S gene dropout as a potential signal for the new strain, okay, which then can be sequenced. So it's not likely, but there is a risk of immune escape if the mutations allow the virus to hide from the immune system. So that's a call for increased genomic surveillance on any suspicious cases at all. Um, so monitoring the genotypes in populations and especially patients that are at risk for reinfection because um, you want to make sure that there isn't some super mutant that we've, you know, are just now discovering or something or vaccine failure. So no evidence of this yet, but just to be on the lookout. The positives are that the spike is a large conserved protein with over 1,200 amino acids. There are many, many, many epitopes for antibodies um, to match, to, to target. So even if we have you know, one or two or 20 mutations, the immune response should produce more than enough types of antibodies so that we'll have enough protection from infection. So I, I don't know, I mean, it's all speculation at this point, but people are, I've heard like several years to five years before, um, but if we get to the point where the vaccine is no longer effective, the good thing is that mRNA vaccines are easy to modify and update because you just basically redesign the mRNA and repackage it. Um, you do need to do some regulatory tests, but um, it's good to go. And it would be much faster, of course, than the initial. So the new variant's been found, is, is being found now around the world, but so far it does look like it did really originate in the UK because the vast majority of identified um, sequences are from there. Uh, so it did escape despite lockdown. It's probably because it had already uh, moved before the lockdown was instituted. Uh, and it is worthwhile noting that the U U.S. is behind on genomic sequencing. So we should also be vigilant. But no evidence of it yet in Hawaii. Um, but Honestly, there hasn't been a lot of sequencing. I mean, it, it just was announced right in December. So um, more effort has to be put in there. So the, there's also the South Africa strain, which has some of the same, but many different ones. Um, and this is speculation. Um, but bo both, uh, both strains are something that we should be on the lookout. So we're still back with our basic public health measures, reduce infection. Okay, get vaccinated, stop the spread <laughs> so that um, we don't keep mutating better and better virus. Um, and that's, that's, that's it, I think. Thanks so much, Marguerite. Uh, I, I have a couple questions, but Francis uh, asked a question, will mono, uh, monoclonal antibodies then be less effective uh, because of viral mutation? It's possible if the specific monoclonal antibody is, of course, if it, if it is targeted to that um, mutated region, it's, it's possible or maybe even likely. But, um, uh, but I, I think that there is effort to, to have antibody cocktails to m really reduce the impact of that possibility. That, that makes sense. I know, at least with the mutations, there's been some rumblings or hypotheses about the current antibody cocktails might not being as effective for, for the new strain. So um, I think that's been in the news uh, the past couple of days. Uh, one question that I have, and you didn't mention um, in one of your previous slides about a study that looked at the originating, how, how it mutated. But as we move forward, there's been more and more uh, studies that have outlined levels of antibodies, uh, you know, for, for not for those who got vaccinated, but for those who got COVID and recovered both mild cases and, and, and severe cases. And then uh, researchers looked at uh, antibody levels up to about a six to eight month period. Um, is there anything we can glean, any conclusions we can glean from those studies and apply it to uh, vaccination lengths in terms of how long someone might be able to uh, be protected for 
because obviously we, we haven't gone eight months um, for, for the clinical trials. So uh, we're, we're hoping to learn something uh, from those who did get COVID, unfortunately. Do, do, you, would you, do you think that's something worth uh, a conclusion that we could potentially draw? That, um, that people are protected longer than eight months or? Or, or, or at least in terms of the conclusions of, you know, we see uh, high levels of antibodies amongst patients who recover from COVID um, up to like, you know, three or four months. And then they're still circulating levels of the antibodies up to up to six to eight months. Um, oh. Is that is that translatable to those who receive the vaccine in terms of uh it's trying to estimate some sort of duration of efficacy uh, for I'm those who receive the sure. vaccine. I mean, I, I'm maybe, I don't know if Francis or somebody else has more knowledge on this area, but I, I mean, from what I remember, uh, um, response, the antibody, circulating antibody titer is supposed to go down. I mean, that's a normal thing, right? And then you have your memory B cells and T mm -hmm. cells so that when you get challenged, it, they spike Way, you know, way up higher than what they were before. So it's, I don't know, like maybe somebody knows more, but it seems a little weird to me that they would have such high titers for such a long time. I, I don't know. Um, and I wonder if that's because they're long haulers, perhaps. I don't know. It could be. Yeah. I, I mean, and I could be, it's been, I've read too many articles. I think we all have um, over the past weeks, but I think the, the, the natural question that people are asking is, Okay, so once someone gets both doses, how long is that going to be good for until we have to, you know, either get a, a, a yearly booster or do we need to restart the whole process? So, um, you know. Well, I just know that like with the flu vaccine, the issue is that the flu mutates much more rapidly than this virus. Mm -hmm. So it's mutating all the time. I mean, and, and way higher. So that's the problem is that by the time the next year comes around, even though you have an intact immune response, it's changed. <laughs> so that's the problem. But um, this, this virus is much more conserved and it's, I think, related to the fact that it has a spike protein, which is very conserved. I mean, across multiple coronaviruses, they have the same spike. And so there's some speculation that people so responses might vary because maybe they had some previous coronavirus infection that has some partial cross reactivity or something like that. Um, and the nice, so that the bad thing is it, it, it attaches to our ACE2 receptor, which is all inside of our mucous membranes and our respiratory system. And it's like all over. I mean, it's an important uh, molecule in our uh, physiology. So that's how the virus gets in. But working against the virus, it has to match that ACE2 mm -hmm. receptor or else it won't be able to infect us. So I, I'm hopeful that actually the um, vaccine protection will be really good and, and long lasting. And the fact that we've had like 95% efficacy is just crazy good. I mean, I don't think there's anything else that's been that high. So I, I think it's, we don't know, but all the signals seem positive. Awesome, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Berryman, Janet, thanks for, uh, for raising your hand. And um, I'm not sure if you, you wanna comment on, on this or, or uh, Billy's question in terms of DOH and the state lab uh, testing for uh, this, you know, this particular variant strain and, and looking out for others. Uh, but, but please go ahead and... and, and um, I, I, I actually raised my, raised my hand to comment on the, the recent question about um, duration of immunity because okay. Marguerite's absolutely right that that with flu vaccine the the reason for a need for an annual vaccine is because that virus mutates very quickly and we don't have other uh, vaccines that require boosting at one year intervals that's actually re-immunizing you against a different strain but the the requirement for boosters and multiple doses of a vaccine or multiple doses at different intervals really is highly variable from vaccine to vaccine. So, uh, you know, childhood vaccines are often multiple doses, often at a two month interval, but sometimes longer. And then there's often a third or a fourth dose. And then we often learn that that works well, but you need a boost booster at five years or at 10 years or when you reach 60. So I think that that sort of 
I, I, I totally agree. The influenza type model seems unlikely with this, but I really don't think we can speculate about the, whether the duration of immunity is going to be more in the two to five year range or in the 10 to 20 year range, because we just haven't had the time to see that yet. No, okay. thanks for that. Definitely, that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I know that the DOH is definitely watching for the variant strain and, and they're ramping up, um, you know, so it was just announced like in December. <laughs> so that's how new this stuff is. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so I, I know that they are already looking at all the sequences. They've looked at what has been collected but how much, I think the open question is, how much sequencing do we need to do? Um, or, I mean, you know, the problem is nobody knows, right? So, so thinking hard about the, the strategy, but definitely they're on it in terms of coming up with a plan. Um, awesome. And then one more question from Francis. Uh, are convalescent plasma used to treat COVID-19 patients usually pooled from multiple donors. Um, is that cause for multiple mutation emerging in a single person? And this, um, Margaret, if you can answer that, that's great. If not, I know this is, this is maybe a yeah, clinician. Sorry. I, I know, I, I know maybe. Sorry, Francis, I don't know. I, I would assume, I, I mean, I, I assume it's from um, plasma donors. I mean, I don't know, Janet, do you know? Or I don't know if anybody knows. I don't Hankin, know if it would be pooled. Oh. So we have doctors here. Yes, maybe the doctors can answer. <laughs> That's I actually a really good question. Don't, I don't know whether it's pooled or not. It's a good question, but but there wouldn't be virus in it. it it's antibodies, so I'm not sure quite what the question is about whether that would drive mutation. Oh, I think that in the study that I reported, I think it was. Well, I, actually, I'm not sure. Um, I, I need to like reread it, would, it. If you had antibodies from multiple donors, that would be more likely to suppress mutation because you would have an even wider set of, of antibodies to, to a wide variety of antigens. But I, I confess I don't know the answer. I, I can ask. Does anybody else? Francis, I, I think everybody um, will reach out to, to our subject matter experts for, for this particular response. And hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, I'll remember to bring this up next week. Yeah, but definitely plasma would have like, I don't know, I don't know how many, but I would imagine thousands, you know, at least of antibodies. So, um, so, but I, I think, you know, we're learning, like, you know, every day there's new research out. So this is all very much um, happening day by day. I mean, I, between the 24th and now, there's been so much, so many updates. It's, it's just nuts. Awesome. And then I see uh, Billy has a, is raising his hand. I apologize. Or Bill, I apologize. I uh, misspoke. Um, Question, comment, Bill. Rukia, can you uh, give Bill uh, audio access, please? But I guess, you know, with that UK study, um, the I think it was just very, very unfortunate. I mean, that was a very immunocompromised patient. And so they had none of their own immune defenses. Um, so, but it is kind of a cautionary tale, I think. Um, and also to have more protection around the caregivers around these people. Bill, go ahead. I believe you have, uh, you have uh, mic capabilities now. Oh, maybe uh, no longer have a question. Let me see. ASIP is recommending not vaccinating after COVID for 90 days because of the enterprise. Okay. So, oh, no problem, Bill. But th thank you for adding 
to that. And then one, one additional thing that um, Janet or Steve, if you want to add to this, because thankfully we've had very low flu rates, if, if any at all in Hawaii. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't keep up our flu vaccination campaigns. I, I believe that the CDC um, though has recommended not getting the flu vaccine concurrently with COVID, at least there's a 14 day uh, period. Um, so that's something that should, I'm sure Janet and Steve, you're tracking as well, but, but for everybody else on the line um, to, to be aware of that, you know, eventually, hopefully not, but eventually flu will come back when travel picks up. So we still need to make sure there's still emphasis on, on, on influenza as well. Awesome. With that, uh, it's 526, so I'll, I'll give four minutes back, um, starting the year off on a good note. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Marguerite, for, for presenting and, and, and everybody's participation, Steve, uh, Janet, um, Bill, and, and we, we really look forward to your participation every week. And please, if you have friends or, or, or coworkers or colleagues who you believe might benefit from this, our goal is just to, to continue to inform the community to the best extent we can and to really engage. Um, and we try to choose topics that uh, are, are pertinent uh, to, to everybody who's concerned public. And um, hopefully there will be a point where we might not need to have uh, deep dives every week because everybody's getting educated and, and we're getting to a point where COVID is uh, getting under control. Um, but until that time comes, we'll, we will continue to, to update uh, everybody in the community so we want to grow that community. So with that, um, have a great rest. Oh, oh and everyone Bill. get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Well, yeah. <laughs> as soon and, as and you're please, able to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Bill, one last point from Bill: convalescent plasma is given in batches, usually one at a time. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, but but with that, please uh, have a safe weekend, um, and we will see you guys next week Thursday at 4:30. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Marguerite. Thanks, Thomas. Oh, thank you.